Hello and welcome to the Idaho Renaissance Fair Inc. YouTube page. Today we have a very special guest. This is Janet. You probably saw her interview as the treasurer of the Idaho Renaissance Fair and as our beloved queen for the time period that we are portraying at our fair. Janet, how are you? I am great. How are you? We are doing amazing. The Everything is starting to come together. We've got a lot of things for Beltane coming up. Just a little plug for this May. Try not to miss it. We the 11th will... and 12th. Yes, ma'am. Now, we wanted to go a little bit into the time frame of the, the time period that we're working with. Our fair is based on what year or what period? We are in Italy, 1494. So... What would you like to talk about today that is about 1494 and what we're trying to portray as a fair? I thought maybe we could talk about the artists and the art of uh, 1490 to 1495 ish. Okay, are these are these going to be any artists that people are going to be familiar with? Yes, absolutely. And then I, I'd like to talk about a couple of maybe not so well-known um, artists and some writers that that maybe we didn't learn about in school or, or maybe got very much glossed over. Okay. Before we jump in, why is this important to you? Because it's a big picture. It's not just a fair. It's not just the king and queen or or the peasants or anything there's a whole world going on that all it's a puzzle and they all come together and we wouldn't have any of it without all the pieces so these characters directly influence still today oh absolutely okay well, absolutely. we're excited who's your first person you'd like to talk about well, let's let's talk about um, Mr. Da Vinci. So, let's start with this. 1490s. We are in full swing of the Renaissance era, right? Things have changed, progressed, creativity is embraced, and it's the talk of the world, right? It's like the happening thing. Art, writing, being creative, putting self-expression um, they call that the humanism movement, where we have people, instead of being outward, start looking in and going, hey, man is the center of my own universe. I am the center of my own universe, and we should embrace our achievements in education, in arts, and literature, and science, so we're starting to get progressive artists and the thinkers and the scientists are now starting to be as revered as your as your clergy and so um you know as the kids would say now these artists and stuff are uh, living their best life when you say they're living their best life at the time there was a lot of religious movement going on as well what what does it look like for them to be living their best life instead of living in poverty and kind of in the shadows and being just pigeonholed into, well, you're going to decorate this Bible, they're actually encouraged to present beautiful works of art. It, a lot of it, yes, is religious iconography, beautiful paintings, or religious leaning, um, or inspired. But they've also now got patrons and workshops, and they... They get together and collaborate. And so it is it is a party. You have artists coming in from all over, the, all over Europe into Italy to train, to study, to work together. Um, it, it's, it's quite interesting. Is it just Italy in general or is there a specific place in Italy? It's Italy in general, but you see them a lot in Milan. Which is and, where our fair is is taking place. Yes, and then uh, no, we're in Naples. Um, and Naples is another center of of art, though. Uh, Ippolita is is Milan, 
and then um, Alfonso is is Naples. So. Gotcha. Yeah, and then in fourteen. 94 the gutenberg press is about 45 to 50 years old and so now we have printing that's going to the masses so all of this information is now getting out much much faster and it's very interesting to think that the gutenberg press is you know almost a century old at you know half a century old at, at this point in our in our fair timeline now the gutenberg press that you're talking that the the gutenberg bible the the thing that made that possible to be yes mass produced has it made its way down to italy then it does yes. do a lot of people have access to the press the the rich do but um from what i understand is it was making it accessible to to the masses so you may have the lower class getting <clears throat> books if they could hand-me-downs pamphlets that sort of thing but it's again mainly your your upper and middle class that's going to have most of it you're st we're still at a time where the lower classes didn't quite read as much so let's talk a little bit about mr da vinci and you know everybody knows da vinci everybody Le knows leonardo da vinci you think of him, you immediately think of inventions, the Mona Lisa, uh, our our Vitruvian man, uh, Mr. Da Vinci, born in April fifth, uh, fourteen fifty-two, lived until May of uh, fifteen nineteen. He was actually supported by the Sforzas, mainly Ludovico, up in Milan who is uh, Ippolita's younger brother. And we always say at the fair, as we always say, us, oh, Ludovico. <laughs> <laughs> now, and Ludovico, you know, the original Duke, Gian, Ludovico mm -hmm. was his uncle, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Supposedly, and, a little bit of uh, lore out there. There may have been an assassination, which is why Gian is no longer... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, there's a little stabity stabity possibly going on there, but you know. Nothing confirmed. Not, nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> never. We are in the period of what we call the High Renaissance. So it's the middle period of, of the actual Renaissance era. Um, and they kind of consider Da Vinci to be the founder of the High Renaissance. You know, we think of him, would you think, when you think of Da Vinci, do you think of him as, like, having so many works and so many things? Well, I would like, imagine that, that he was busy all the time. Like, he had to have been pumping out stuff just left and right, right? Did you know that he has fewer than 25 major works attributed to him? I don't know. Why, why so <laughs> few? Did they just not survive? They, he just didn't publish anything. So he was known for his notebooks mainly at the time. Notebooks, unfinished work, and paintings. I sometimes wonder maybe if he got bored and wandered off um, or if another, another thought seized him and, and went in. So he um, might have been a little ADD is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I can relate. I can relate. I have a billion projects going. I can relate to this, to this thing. So, you know, he's got dry, concept drawings of things that we see now. Armored combat fighting vehicles. Uh, an adding machine that used ratios to work. Flying machines. Um, he made major discoveries in things like civil engineering, hydrodynamics, geology, anatomy, and even optics. But because he never published any of those findings, he had little to no impact on the subsequent science of the time. So he had all these concepts and he had all of these things in his notebooks that we have gone back now and discovered but he never actually published it, so it had no impact at the time. He worked, he started early, 
Um, at about 14, he was an apprentice to uh, Andrea Del Verrocchio, who had a studio. And Del Verrocchio had, was the leading Florentine painter and sculptor at that time. So he was kind of the guy that was up there. And he would have, at, at Del Verrocchio's studio, he would have met Botticelli, um, Cirlandio, Peregrino, all these things. At about 20 years old, he qualified a mass, as a master at the Guild of St. Luke. And the Guild of St. Luke was the Guild of Artists do and Doctors of Medicine, which is an interesting combination there to me. Artists and doctors, which I, I guess it works. A doctor is an artist in his own right. Um, he did end up getting his own studio, but he still continued to live with Andrea and uh, collaborate with him for a long time. So in 1494, uh, Da Vinci was working in Milan, and he painted a few things around that time. One of them was La Bella, La Bella Ferronera, who is a portrait of Lucrezia Crivelli, who was um, probably one of Ludovico's mistresses. <laughs> so that was very nice. It was very nice of him to paint that. And he had plans to cast a giant horse statue, but Ludovico took the material that da Vinci was going to use to cast this horse and sent it to his brother-in-law for defending Milan from Charles of France. So Ludovico's like, yeah, sure, you can you can cast this horse. And then he's like, oh, wait a minute. No, 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 I, I, I need that to uh, defend Milan. Oh, my See? word. So they stole Leonardo's materials. I can't imagine that made him very happy. Did, would, did no, he... no. And he never he never actually ended up finishing that project. One of many so, unfinished. One of, one of many unfinished. Um, and during that time when he was, uh, you know, working for the Sforzas, um, he did stuff like floats and pageants and put together these elaborate parties and decorations and, and things for them. So which... he was a caterer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, he, he didn't do the cooking, obviously, but, you know, I mean, I just imagine, like, my brain went to, a, like, old school floats, like, these beautiful, like, carnival um, style, oh. like, that's where my brain went, you know, obviously there's no pictures, um, but I'm sure they were definitely so we're talking about the royalty of milan right the the rulers the highest people in milan so they're going to have these elaborate pageants and floats and flowers and sculptures probably and then ludovico also had him design the cupola for the the cathedral in milan at what, the, around that time what's a cupola it's like the top so you've got a lot of times, especially on Catholic ar architecture, you've got like a, a round tower that goes up and at the top is usually like, um, it almost looks like a hat, like a Pope's hat. Oh, the it's like a bronze round. cap. Yeah, yeah. So those are, you know, those are cupolas. They're, they often have windows or there's a, sometimes bells put into them, but it's usually very fancy and, and ornate. He also finished a couple of things then. He did uh, the Virgin of the Rocks, or it was also called the Madonna of the Rocks, and he finished that in late 1493. And then he started the Last Supper in oh. painting of the Last Supper in 1495 ish, and finished that in 1498. So he was definitely busy, but he did not finish a ton of things. So one of the other guys I mentioned that worked at that studio was Botticelli. And Botticelli is best known, I think most people know him for the birth of Venus. Painting. Oh, yes. Venus coming out of the water on the giant seashell. 
Um, he also did a lot of paintings of women that were more uh, robust. Just, I, I mean, just not the super, super skinny. Right, they were healthy. They were healthy women. You've got Botticelli working at that time. Um, Botticelli was one of the people who worked on the Sistine Chapel. There were a lot of, of artists at that time that did work at that Sistine Chapel. Is it Michelangelo um, supposed to be like the main one for the Sistine Chapel? He did a lot, but there were others too. He gets a lot of the credit because of the, the you know, the hand of God picture. But, but there were many others that actually worked on it. And the Sistine Chapel that we have now is the second one really um i'm not entirely sure what happened to the first but the one that we see now was actually built in between 1472 and 1488 and then from 1488 until the late 1500s they were decorating the heck out of it <laughs> botticelli though again lots of religious works um he did in about 1493, he really seemed to have stopped doing a lot of the religious paintings for some reason. It, it's not documented necessarily as why, but he finished uh, an altarpiece and kind of just, just stopped doing the religious and just went to more natural, hey, this is a person doing a thing. And you mentioned Michelangelo. Um, he was working during the 1490s, but he was really young. So he was born in 1475. Um, and he only really has a couple of things attributed to him during the 1490s. Uh, a wood carving called Crucifix that was done in 1493. And then a marble statue of Hercules. And then Ooh. some small figurines for uh, the Shrine of St. Dominic. And then, like, a Madonna and a Battle of Centaurs, which I would love to find a picture of and post because that, that sounds fascinating. Okay, so Michelangelo, he was a patron of the Medicis. He was in their court, fell out of favor, but he got back into favor. Do you know how he did that? Well, how does Michelangelo fall out of favor? I mean, he's like an, a god of art. <laughs> they, they, it doesn't really tell me, so it must have been scandalous. <laughs> uh, but he he and he did fall out of favor for a little bit, but but he did. So, do you want to hear how he got back into favor with the Medici's? Oh yeah. In 1494, he was hired to make skull, snow sculptures for the Medicis. You said snow sculptures? Yes. As in, you take a chainsaw and, and carve the eyes like, like snowman? Snowman? S snowman, minus the chainsaw. Um, oh. ch snowman, I, I was reading one thing and it did refer to them as snowmen. Um, but then others say snow sculptures. So um, I am picturing McCall Carnival. I am. <laughs> I am picturing uh, Calvin and Hobbes' uh, snowman army. <laughs> um, it, it's, it is the best way that I have ever seen to get back in, in somebody's good graces. That so. must have been some of the most amazing snow work like of all time. To earn, right. earn yourself favor with nobility again. Because they don't right. last forever. No, no. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know that you would make these snow sculptures. And we can't walk past a snowman now without the urge. And I've never done it except for to my own. But there's that urge. That, <laughs> that little over. voice <laughs> that says, kick it over. <laughs> Just knock it over. I don't know. It. I wish again. One of those times that I wish there was just a photograph, possibly, you know, that it had been possible for them to immortalize this, even in a painting. Like, if they, 
the cameras had just been invented. I just would like one picture of Michelangelo's snow sculptures. Like that must have been, you're right, that must have been some sculptor. So he finds his way back into favor with his amazing snow art. And then what does he do? Um, then he is, he is a patron for them. He ends up working on the Sistine Chapel, producing all of the things that we think of when we think of, of, um, Michelangelo. I, I honestly, I did not do much beyond the 1490s since we were just kind of focusing on it, but he is, he is a busy, busy man. Well, and there's your teaser for anyone watching, you know, Again, as Janet said, we're mainly focusing right around our time period because our characters were real people. This was their life. Things were happening in the moment at that time. And we're just trying to bring a bit of it to our fair to show it off. And these people, this was all brand new to them. Mm -hmm. This was exciting and big and and it's still exciting and big to us, but for the time. And then their lives weren't over. They continued on, but ours is a snapshot. Yeah, of... a moment in time. These these are our musicians and rock stars and actor, you know, TV stars of the day. These are these are the people that, oh, I had to venture it over for dinner, you know, which Ippolita and then... Alfonso were big supporters of these people, of, of Da Vinci, of Botticelli, of Michelangelo. Um, these are the people they supported. There is a female writer I'd like to tell you about that I have a suspicion um, Ippolita may have interacted with or known or supported. So her name was Laura Serretta. She was an Italian writer. She's born in 1469 and lived until 1499. She was a That's not very feminist. old. No, she was young. She was young, and she, they don't know what killed her. And I always get suspicious, especially um, that time period when when you see a young woman pass away. A lot of times it's <clears throat> foul play. She was, well, she was an anomaly because she was a edu very educated woman. Uh, minor nobility. She lived in Venice, Brescia, and Verona. She did have a patron who was a Sforza. Um, she wrote letters to she wrote mainly in the form of letters that she would then compile and and issue volumes of um talking about things that that they really didn't talk about that to, at that time um educating women women's issues and then just like her daily life which is is a lot of times very intimate and very and I, I don't mean intimate in, in like, you know, what she was doing with men intimate, but like very personal, very, I got up, I did this thing, you know, and this is how it affected me. Um, she, <clears throat> she did, she was sent to a convent to learn. Her father was very much a supporter of women's education, um, and he sent her to a convent to learn. She learned about not just religion, but reading, writing. She spoke Latin. She embroidered. She did all of these things, moral philosophy. When she returned from the convent, she actually was her father's secretary. And so she learned about mathematics, astrology, agriculture, political matters of state, that sort of thing. And she would publish these books. Um, and so it's my, and I'm going to research further, but um, I have a feeling based on that, her and Ippolita, their, their philosophies definitely aligned. Ippolita was um, also very much, she wrote, she 
publish things, that's that sort of thing. So the chance, and with this, a sport as a patron, the chances are that they may have um, crossed paths or known of each other, um, which I think would be really cool. I think I would really like to, to find out more on, on that one. Well, like you said, it does make sense, especially where Ippolita was such a strong character. I mean, she she was giving speeches to the Pope when she was a young girl, wasn't she? At 10. At 10 years old, she gave a speech for the Pope. Yeah. So, chances are um, this this young woman may have... I would I would assume they probably had, at very minimum known of each other. Unfortunately, in 1488, her father passed away, and she published her last set of letters and wrote no more. And because she died 11 years later. Do we know why she wrote no more? She said that she just no longer felt the inspiration to write. Oh. Which is a shame because when she was younger, she said she would seek fame and immortality through her writing. And again, had you ever heard of this young woman? Never. Sadly, no. Sadly, no. So I thought she was one that would be good to, to bring up. That's very interesting, like, because you don't think about it. When, when we think of history, we think of the women's rights movement from the 20s when they were trying to get the right to vote here in the United States, at least as far as we, as far as I know. Like, I, you never think about 500 years ago, women were fighting the exact same fight. <laughs> exact same battle. You know, you've got, you've got... So I, I tried to find more. I did not find as many ladies as as I would have liked. So, but I'm still looking. So we're not, we're not done with that necessarily. Well, and this is probably a good place to start wrapping up this portion. As as everyone who can see, as they've listened and as they've seen the pictures and the other images, there's this is this is just the surface. There are reasons there are professors who specialize in this time period because there's so <laughs> much going on. And and Janet, are we planning on doing more with with just everything from this time period? Yeah, yeah. I would like to see. I would like to present an ongoing series of that time period. I'd like to. I'd love to introduce you to. The rulers um, of the time period, not just in Italy, but let's talk about our neighbors. Let's talk about the professions. Let's talk about the agriculture and the history, like the not the history, but the wars and the conflicts and the and the alliances that were going on at the time. You know, little teaser, uh, 1494. For my for my other uh, English England fans, uh, we have the first Tudor. You're not kidding. The Tudors literally just started. Mm-hmm. Yep. So the there's a lot I would like to bring you as far as um, future installments, but there because there's a lot to dive into. I we could talk about the art alone for months. <laughs> <laughs> and we probably will come back. I mean, there's yes. there's so much to touch on, and it's not like we're going to run out of time. So do make sure to leave a comment. What is something that you personally are interested in hearing? Something maybe you would like us to do a presentation on? We're open to ideas and thoughts. Uh, Janet, teaser for next time? Let's talk about the... Let, let's talk about the the uh, wars and conflicts and alliances going on. Okay. Because I mentioned I mentioned the Italian wars. Let's chat about that next time. Okay. So there you go. Join us next time when we present on the wars and some of the political involvement behind them, the <laughs> secret alliances, because there's always secret alliances. Everyone's related to everyone in the nobility, so 
Yep, and do comment. What are some things you would like to hear? It, would you like us to go more in depth on something? Do remember that this is all an act of love. We are not paid professionals in any of this. We just love our history. And just as the Renaissance Fair always has been, we hope your history is as exciting as our history. And we will catch you all on the next video. Huzzah! Huzzah!